It's amazing to be able to, to play drums professionally, to be steeped in this world of, of that very specific style of, well, essentially communication. You know, drums were born of a way to tell stories and to, and to tell ideas and, and communicate over great distances. And not only that, but to also tell a story non-verbally. Art, I, I hold in the highest regard of anything we could be doing on this planet. I'm honored to be even associated with the notion of art as a profession. I went to NYU, I got a bachelor's of music in uh, specializing in technology. It was sort of a double major. I was taking a lot of credits. Uh, I was performing in ensembles, jazz ensembles, the percussion ensemble. I did an off-Broadway show in the pit. To be able to play drums in that sort of reckless abandon, tribal, sometimes maniacal kind of way, it's such a blessing. Being a New York drummer is incredibly exciting and fulfilling, and I wouldn't really want to be anything else. And we're live. Welcome to Music Matters with Jason Tram. We're so delighted you can join us for our unique podcast community where we explore issues and challenges in the performing arts world as seen through the eyes of distinguished colleagues. Thank you so much for joining us today. Please remember to subscribe to us on YouTube and hit that bell icon for the most up-to-date information and upcoming guests and topics. And we have a lot in 2021. This is our first episode of the 2021 season, and we're so happy you can join us today. We have a wonderful guest today. We have Mr. Mark Frankel, who is a uh, the captain of the Blue Man Group Performance Troupe in New York City, and we're delighted he can join us. Welcome, Mark Frankel. Hey, thanks for having me, Jason. Pleasure to be here. So glad. So glad you can be here. And uh, 2020 was certainly a year we all look forward to hopefully forgetting or moving aside. And uh, 2021, we have a chance to start things up again. And boy, do we hope that's soon. Yeah, we really need this page turn. This has been a, um, you know, I, I saw something today that piqued my interest. It said, you know, wasted year 2020. And I couldn't disagree more. Um, it was it was not a wasted year. It was a, a year that that, that was incredibly challenging and difficult and, and disappointing and, and horrible. But um, we all learned a lot and I had some really enriching experiences. I missed my job, but I've, I've, um, I've, I've oddly enjoyed a lot of it. So, you know, trying to see the upside. Well, it certainly forced us to change and to rethink and to reimagine. And um, I, I've been amazed on this show, particularly, we, I spent so much time with artists talking about innovations and discoveries and, and ways that creative artists have been creative and have used their, their, their gifts and their challenges to look at new possible ways of doing things and new, any discoveries you've made in the last six months. Um, well, I've, um, personally speaking, I've been experimenting with enhancing um, the virtual experience uh, through technology because um, before Blue Man, before I became a, a Blue Man, I was a, an audio engineer. And so I was watching uh, my mother's dance studio. They, they were doing these um, virtual classes at her dance studio. And I was watching the teachers struggle to, to get the audio right with the students. And it seemed very kind of disjointed and disconnected. So I I decided to kind of jump into ways that we could enhance the virtual learning experience. And that's been kind of, if nothing else, just engrossing. Um, and I've also learned that, that there can be uh, a valid version of entertainment and connection virtually. It's not ideal and it's not what we really want, but, but it, it can succeed. Um, so who knows what's in the future? Maybe, maybe we'll see more folding in of virtual elements, uh, live virtual elements to real performance. Um, maybe people who have either, what is it, you know, disabilities or agoraphobia can, can, can still remain uh, uh, viable and connected in, in, the, in the world. So, and if they have something to say creatively and they can't get out of the house, they can still do it. So th there's, been, there's been some interesting things that have developed certainly has given us a chance to connect in ways we never did before and uh, meetings have gone virtual and um, maybe the limit we can limit the fossil fuel by uh, doing a lot of meetings online and yep. getting back to live performance but it, i think some of this stuff will stick i think some of this technology will be increased and will stay with us as we move to the next chapter yeah I, I, there was a definitely my work at blue man definitely had a corporate element to it because of my position as a captain i was i had sort of an administrative position and we did a lot of meetings a lot of meetings uh, either creative, administrative, or you name it. And uh, I think we learned that Zoom would be our friend going forward if we were to continue with those meetings, you know. Well, I think that's how it'll start up again before we all get back to our, our previous lives. Why don't we take it back um, to the beginning of your artistic development? Now, Mark, I've, I've known you for many years. Uh, we actually attended the same high school right. a, few years, a few years ago. 
a few, just a few, what, a couple decades, uh, whatever. And you're from a wonderful artistic family uh, out of uh, Rockland County. Take us back to uh, the beginnings of, did you always know you wanted to be an artist? Well, I, I'm kind of, you know, I, I grew up in a, in a performing family, obviously. I'm, I think we figured it out. I'm a either fourth or fifth generation performer going back to uh, England, my great grandparents in England. Um, and it's mostly focused on dance. Uh, dance and classical music. My grandfather was a violinist and a pianist. And my grandmother was a pianist and also a ballet teacher. Obviously, my mother um, was a dance teacher who established a dance studio. But before that, she had a long Broadway career. Um, so, yeah, I grew up very much steeped in that world. So at a very young age, um, it seemed not only normal, but um, likely that that's what I was going to do with my life. And for some reason or other, I don't know why I gravitated towards the drums. Um, so yeah, I started playing drums when I was about four years old, um, and was heavily encouraged and, and, and Rockland, you know, if you're not from Rockland it is fertile ground. There are a lot of artists, um, people that had moved up from the city, um, and were attracted to the, the rural environment. And so I, I was able to study with a world-class, uh, drum instructor, a guy named Gary Chester, who, um, published a, a book called the new breed, a uh, modern drummer published this book, The New Breed, um, which is one of the Bibles of drum set study. And I was lucky enough to study with him. And so that really got my, my interest in drumming um, going as potentially a career. And alongside with that, I also had an interest in, in tech and in, in audio technology. So um, I sort of mushed them together, went to NYU for music technology um, and uh, found my love of audio engineering Side note, though, uh, growing up, I also took some acting classes at the dance studio, my mother's dance studio. It was there, you know, it was like free. My mother's like, you know, take anything you want, take dance, you know. And I, I did not gravitate toward dance. It was not my thing. But um, I could boogie, don't get me wrong. But, um, <laughs> so, but I did like the acting classes. So I had that in my back pocket as something that was mildly interesting um, as another career, potentially. Uh, and then, uh, so then I, you know, I got this degree in music technology. I went full tilt into audio engineering. I ended up teaching at NYU. I taught the um, advanced audio recording, uh, two, a two semester, two track uh, um, class. I uh, taught there for years. Um, and then funnily enough, I was working as an engineer. I was drumming professionally. I was playing a lot of cabaret um, and some sessions. And funnily enough, I got this random uh, sort of set of circumstances that led me to the Blue Man audition while I was teaching at NYU. And so I had to um, sort of surreptitiously be um, uh, sort of in training to be a blue man while I was teaching my classes. And I didn't want to tell my students because I didn't want to generate some kind of negative attention or what on earth are you talking? You're an audio engineer. Why are you going to be a blue man? And so I just kind of kept it under wraps. Um, there's a long story there, but it was kind of an interesting thing. So, you know, that's amazing how the life works out and the careers work out. What year what did you uh, did you do the uh, blue man audition? So that would have been uh, fall of 2004. <clears throat> I was, um, like I said, I was working as an audio engineer and a drummer. And I was, you know, I was happy. But those two careers are not necessarily going to pay the bills. It's a struggle. Um, both of them are, are difficult careers to make a living in. Not to say I wasn't going to do it or, or I didn't have the dream to do it. But I was struggling, for sure. Um, and so I, uh, I was a member of the... Um, the, the Grammy Committee, it's called NARIS, uh, the National Academy of Recording Arts and Sciences. And um, they invite people to all these parties. So through NARIS, through the Grammy Committee, I got invited to a, a party at, at Blue Man Group's, um, one of their creative spaces in the East Village. So this would have been in September of 2004. And so why not? You know, I'll just go there and sort of schmooze and hobnob. And I had, I, I'd known some people that were involved in Blue Man. I'd actually been to that creative space earlier as an audio engineer. So I, I thought <clears throat> it'd be a good way to, to network. And so I was going there with the mindset I was going to network as a recording engineer. Maybe end up, because they, they had a recording studio in this space, so I thought maybe I'll end up um, getting some work as an engineer. And uh, walking around, you know, and, and they have all of their instruments out, the tubes and things on pulleys and drums, and, and, and they're very open, very very willing to let you kind of try everything and touch everything. and they're, and. Um, that part of it was very kind of like, wow, this is like a playground. You know, this isn't, this isn't what I expected. I expected it to be kind of stuffy. You know, I know it's, I didn't know much about the show, but I knew it was very professional and very established. And so I thought there would be kind of, have some ownership over this stuff. 
But no, they were just like, here, come on in and drink and eat and play. And I was like, oh, I, I like this environment. That must be amazing for a percussionist to have that type of uh, playground oh, yeah. and fun. Because, I mean, drums are one thing. Bang, boom, whap, that's fun. But when you hear tubes that when you move them, the pitch changes and, and there's these odd ethereal sounding instruments or aboriginal sounding instruments and i was i was frankly i was drawn in just in that moment and so anyway i'm, I'm walking around and i overhear this fella say um oh yeah we're always looking for new blue men and that sort of you know piqued my interest i had a little i had a little liquid courage and um i went over to him and i said hey listen i i couldn't help but overhear that you know you say that you, you're always looking for new blue men um I'm a drummer and I've done a little acting. I mean, what does it take? I mean, I thought there were still the original three guys. I don't know much about the show. And he's like, oh, no, no, we've expanded. There's a, there's a lot of blue men now. And, and um, you know, frankly, he's like, tell you what, back up. And he had me do like a, like a 360. He had me like turn around and, and sort of look me over. We call it, he gave me a bath. <laughs> we call that sometimes. Um, it's a little uncomfortable, but, and he said, you know what? You look right. You have the right face, the right personality, the right physical build. He's like, send me your headshot and resume of which I had really neither for this kind of thing for a performance uh, resume, but I scraped some stuff together, sent it to them and um, they called me in and that was the beginning of a, um, Oh, like a, like a six month journey to finally being sort of given the, the th not, not to spoil spoiler alert. I got hired, <laughs> but that six months was a lot of, Oh, I'm going to get fired. Oh, maybe I'll get hired. Oh, I'm going to get fired. And it was, um, it, it was, it was without a doubt, um, the most and that, challenging and difficult experience of my, uh, of my tender 46 years. Yeah. So what was it like when you got the call that you actually got the job? Well, I was so exhausted and so beat up from this process of being told I was terrible or I was great or I was doing well or not. So uh, it, it, there was a sense of relief and like, uh, at least it's over. Um, and then maybe in the, in the coming months, it started to, started to sort of dawn on me that I was embarking on this, this sort of rare thing, you know, this thing that only few people are going to get to do <clears throat> and what a gift it was. And, and so that sort of excitement, um, built over time. I mean, the first time I was on stage when I was, um, you know, in, in the audition process, essentially you get, you get kind of tossed up on stage, you know, two months in, uh, sort of for, for test. Uh, test performances. I did not enjoy it. It was not fun. I was miserable, actually, uh, because um, I wasn't really a working actor. I was, uh, uh, you know, like I, I was a drummer. I felt like I'd sort of cheated my way, kind of, kind of gamed the system and cheated my way to, to the stage. I didn't have a lot of self confidence for this. I, I had self confidence as a drummer and, and, and in other aspects of my life, but not as a drumming clown. I mean. I felt like an utter fraud up there. And, um, you know, you're wearing all this stuff and you got a bald cap and grease paint. You can't open your mouth. You can't speak. You can't, you know, open your mouth to breathe. And I felt utterly trapped and squeezed and, and almost as if I had ripped Van Winkle. Someone had knocked me out and I woke up and here I am on stage whacking on pipes, audience looking at me thinking, how did I get here? And uh, it was not a comfortable feeling, to be honest. <laughs> What percentage of the of, of the performance on the blue is your percussion training, and what percentage is the acting that you had to learn? Well, that's the thing. Um, I am part of a very small minority of blue men who are who have basically no acting experience and all drumming experience. Um, most blue men are actors with some or no drumming experience. Oh, wow. um, because the acting and the, and the portrayal of the Blue Man character is the majority of the show. It is, I mean, if you want to talk about a ratio, I would say it's something like 90% uh, oh, wow. Blue Man and 10% drumming. There's music throughout, but the reason why the ratio is so high to acting is because even when you're drumming, the overarching thing is, is the storytelling. Um, so, you know, you could be executing the most difficult pattern, but if you have your head down, and you're drawn into your instrument, you're not doing it right. You know, you got to be up and up and out and telling the story. And, um, you know, that, that all helps to underscore that this music thing is a, is a language for the blue man. It's not it's not him. Some, it's not ego based. It's not something he's showing off. It's not this technical wizardry. It's this other version of expression, just just as simple as talking or walking. 
And so to, to strike it's that such balance, it's such amazing performance yeah. art. It's such amazing performance art. Um, and all my kids saw it on the class trips, and one of them actually met you backstage. And it was, that was I reached out to you on Facebook. It was such a, it was yeah. like two worlds colliding. It was pretty cool. Yeah, that does happen. You know, uh, yeah. I, I mean, performance art. I mean, I don't, I don't know what, what it is. It's, it's, um, it's, it's something that's very difficult to describe. But it's, uh, the, 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 the real thing is, is just this, this notion of connecting. And, and I feel like it carries through to something like this, like that we're doing right now. To me, this is very similar to the Blue Man performance. Um, I'm trying to be, um, <clears throat> be present. I'm trying to, to, to not think about how I look or how I sound. I'm just trying to, to, to connect and, 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 be, and, and have my ego as, as little a part of this as possible, you know? Um, and that's really what I think the show was, was about. It, it, it was like almost akin to seeing a dog you know, the way a dog would interact with the world, you know, curious, no real uh, sense of history uh, or self-consciousness. You know, dogs are just present here now. Whatever happened yesterday, that's yesterday. You know, we're here, you know. We have our first question from the audience. This is from, this is Stephanie from Yonkers, New York. And uh, she asks, how do you get in that paint and how long does it take to get in and out? So um, the makeup process uh, takes about 30 minutes. Um, roughly speaking, when I first started, it took a lot longer. But the, the, the majority of that time is getting the bald cap on. So um, I am not, a lot of people ask if I have to shave my head. Um, I've had longer hair than this and been a performing blue man. Um, so the bald cap, you have to put glue on this part of, oh, I have to put on my contact lenses first. Um, I don't have to wear those right now. That's been a treat. Uh, so you put glue on this part of your face. Oh, and I shaved too. Uh, and then all around your neck, and then this bald cap gets um, adhered to your head. And then that has to be done with a, with a makeup and wardrobe person. Um, it's very precise. They want it to be nice and clean, get a nice uh, seamless edge. Um, it has to be trimmed just right. And that is time consuming. Once that's down, the makeup goes on in all of a few minutes. I mean, now that I'm experienced with it, I, I can, you know, getting it when you're new at it, uh, getting up to your eyelids is, is a little delicate, but I just would go like rub it right in and boom, boom, boom. So I could get I could get the blue on in about two minutes uh, up my nose, you know, in my mouth. Um, you really don't want to have any flesh exposed at all. Uh, and then to get it off. Ten minutes, you know, rip, rip the cap off. We use a lot of this specific type of oil, a very heavy oil that oddly enough, because it's grease paint, it's a very greasy substance. But oil is the thing that will remove it. Um, and I can get I get it off in about 10 minutes, take a shower, and you'd, you'd never know. I'd walk out the theater. So if there were two shows in a row, I'd walk out between shows, and I'm just another guy. Like Superman. Yeah, so I'll sort of. Not as, <laughs> I can't, you know, I can't fly. I can't change in a, in a phone booth. Maybe I could. Well, what you, what you do in that show is Superman. It's really quite amazing. Yeah. Um, and watching the videos and the, all the instruments and the characterizations, it's, it's amazing what, that, what they've done. Um, so you got into the production that people may not realize you didn't go right on to the New York cast. Didn't you travel around quite a bit before you uh, became to the New York? Yeah, so the New York uh, production is um, for some and for a, a quite a few blue men in the company is a coveted position um, because you can do so much other creative work um, when you're performing because you know, the, the blue man schedule is demanding, but there is free time. Um, so you can go off and do other things. And, and in New York, obviously, there's you could pick your destiny. There's so much other work to do as a creative performer. Um, so when I first got hired, uh, I wanted to stay in New York because this is my home. I was born, born and raised, born in the city, raised 20 miles north. But I ended up going out to Chicago, the show in Chicago for a, a couple, a little less than two years, then got invited to perform in a new show that they were opening in Holland in Amsterdam. And I opened that show, um, performed there for about nine months. Um, and I, and then now I had the bug of, you know, I was sort of untethered still in my early thirties. I wasn't married. I was thinking, okay, well, this is, if I'm going to, if I'm going to go out there and, and see the world, I think this is it. So I said, okay, I don't want to come back to New York or Chicago. Uh, what else you got? <laughs> and, uh, I got offered to go on a world tour, um, like an arena tour. They, they had this sort of rock show, this, how to be a megastar show that was back in, 2006 to 2010 and um they said how would you like to perform on that and i had always wanted to be on a on a what they call a bus and truck arena tour with sleeper buses sleeping on the bus 
you know, the backstage pass in the arenas. And I got my, my dream and I went out on that tour. I did all of the, all of North America, uh, some of South America, uh, Asia, Europe. Um, and it was for the better part of two to four years. It's a little foggy because I did a few other tours and stuff, but yeah, it was the absolute time of my life. And then when that all kind of wrapped up around 2010, 11, I came back to New York and started there and, and I've been in, I've been in the Astor Place show since from 2011 to 20. Now was Astor Place, that was where they, the show first, um, the first permanent helm of the show? Yep, Astor Place Theater was where they first did it in 19, November of 1991. Um, it was a repertory theater before that, and then it's been Blue Man's home ever since. The original three Blue Men, or two of the original three, ended up buying the entire building, wow. which is a landmark building. It's Jacob, one of Jacob Astor's buildings, um, one of his homes. And um, yeah, then it, it grew from there. And within a few years, it, it opened in Boston at the... Um, Charles Street Playhouse, and then it opened in Chicago, and then in Las Vegas, and then in Orlando. Berlin was in there somewhere. Um, it really expanded, really blew up in the um, sort of late late 90s, early aughts is when it really exploded. Sure, and it's been a, a staple of um, a staple of the off-Broadway repertoire and um, has been so much in pop culture. Um, and I've yeah. seen it on TV, I've seen it in magazines, and it's... Um, it's such a cool, um, such a cool expression. And uh, boy, what are some of the most memorable performances you've done, or some of the people you've performed for as a Blue Man? Well, I mean, at Astor, it, one of the kicks of performing at Astor is you get to. There's quite a few celebrities that come through, um, and uh, you know they have their entourage and their people that that call ahead and make sure that that everything is just the way they want it. Whether they want to meet the talent or the talent, whatever the people in the show, whether they want to meet them or not, whether they want to go backstage or to just get hustled right out. So we always know by and large when someone's going to be in the audience. So I perform for, um, honestly, I, I can't remember them all. Um, some things that jump, one, one that jumps out was um, Heidi Klum came to see the show and she wanted to meet us, but she wanted a very particular, she really wanted to have a special meet and greet and, and she wanted to be painted up in blue makeup and take pictures with us. And, um, you know, we, we sort of put the kibosh on, on her uh, getting into the blue makeup but he said, okay, sure, we can have this private meet and greet with us. Of course, you're, you know, you're Heidi Klum. And as um, soon as we saw her, you know, we, we, we all meet up. And we're sort of still kind of in character because there are some, some people around, but we're about to drop character and just start chatting with her. She looks at us and she says, oh, but I wanted to be blue too. You know, she was still kind of hung up on this thing. Of, and so I took my hand and, and the, the grease paint is always wet. It stays wet the whole time. So I took a big wipe from the back of my head and I just went to her face and I dragged my face down from her face from her forehead down to her chin and just smeared her face with blue. And there are these pictures floating around that you can find around the internet of free blue men with Heidi Klum and her face is, to that's my handprint dragging on her face. Um, so, you know, there was stuff like that. I, I got to perform for um, some of my heroes, uh, you know, um, people from, from music that I really admired. Um, I performed at Nassau Coliseum, which was um, where I saw all my favorite bands as a kid, you know, Billy Joel, Kiss, Rush, you know, I saw all those bands there. And, I, and then I had that moment of standing on that stage and looking out and having that perspective that my heroes had. And those were one of those moments where I really sort of um, wanted to say, remember this, remember this, like, it's, this isn't just another gig. This is Nassau Coliseum, you know, so that was memorable. I got to perform at the Hollywood Bowl. That was wild. Wow. Yeah. Um, I don't know. There's, I, clearly, I could go on. Uh, there's been a lot of, of really fun and, and bizarre and unforgettable experiences. Such so many mountaintop experiences and uh, such an exciting line of work. And how do you maintain your focus and energy uh, on a show like a Broadway show, which is like eight shows a week? How do you maintain your every show, keeping your energy level up and continuing your excellence? Well, without a doubt, without a doubt, that is the most challenging aspect of the work is to approach the show um, that I have done without exaggerating three to 4,000 times um, and to approach it in the way that um, the, the audience wants it. You know, people have, there's, there's, there's every night there's people in that theater, that 300 seat theater that have been thinking about going to see Blue Men for 10 years, 15, 20 years and said, okay, I'm finally gonna go. And they buy their ticket, who knows, maybe they buy it for their whole family. It's a big cash outlay you know, months in advance, they get everyone in the car, they come to see the show. Now, right there, if you think about, if you think about them, 
you have to honor that. You have to honor that, that, that they deserve the best that you can do. Now, me personally, I might have had a, had a fight with my partner. I, I might be tired. I might be sick. I might be just utterly not into performing that night. But I don't have a choice. So obviously, that's the big challenge of the work. And to, so, so what really helps, one thing that helps muscle memory, I can do the show for all intents and purposes. I could do the show in my sleep. My body, almost in a way that can be bizarre, walks through the show without me thinking about it. Musically, I can just play the stuff without any real thought. It is very much akin, the, the, the analogy I would make is to walking or eating or breathing. Or, it's very much autonomic like that. So with that in mind, I don't have to put a lot of effort into, into, the, into the basics of the show. And so really, you're not asking for a lot from me to say, okay, let's give that extra 20% of energy to do this like you've never done it before. And that is, um, that's something that takes a lot of focus and a lot of energy, and it's definitely the most challenging aspect of the work. Certainly, um, as, as, a, as a conductor, um, I may do an opera, I may do five or six or eight shows at a time, but then the repertoire changes, and it's so different when you, all my colleagues on Broadway, how they, there's so many performances to do and to maintain the focus through those. That's a real, always, I'm always curious about, about artists like yourself who, who do such high-level work for long periods of time. Really quite amazing. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, we, 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 would, we would talk about it. You know, there, there are times where I, I said to myself, you know, I don't know how much longer I can do this. I said that at five years. I said that at 10 years. I was saying that at 15 years, you know. Um, we, 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 the analogy we made was the golden cage, um, which, which gets into the, the dicey area of starting to, to, to not appreciate it for what it is or, or to even sound like I was complaining. I, I don't mean to, to, to put that out there at all. It's just that it's a wonderful, amazing dream job but anything that you do for money repetitively will wear on you and so you know uh, that's life you know it's uh, that's you, true you gotta, you gotta and, take and it, the good with the bad yep and that's so what do you do when you're not blue manning what's your now you're a creative artist you're, you're uh, you do audio engineering do you still do a lot of performing on the drums uh, do you still do a lot of audio engineering what do you do when you're not being a blue man well pre before pre-covid <laughs> Honestly, uh, might be between having a, a toddler, a house that's 60 miles north of the city from 1849 that needed a ton of renovation. So between maintaining the house, my toddler, and trying to have, you know, a normal life, I didn't have much, frankly, much time for another creative uh, output. So yeah, kids do take a little bit of time. I can attest bit, to that. So. <laughs> just a bit. Even one is all I have, but just a little bit of time. But, but when COVID hit, you know, this is going back to what I was saying earlier, all of that, it was almost as if I just woke up and, and said, oh, yeah, I'm not just a blue man. I am a drummer. I'm an audio engineer. I, I like to do all these other things. And so, you know, here I am in, in this studio. Um, I have a separate studio on, on, on my property, like a, my own little building. Uh, and as I play, I record. I've been working on some creative projects for other people, doing it all remotely. You know, recording here, sharing the tracks with somebody at another studio and, and, and collaborating in that way, which is not something that's new for COVID. That's how a lot of people were creating. Um, it's much more, much more, it's much easier to do it now with the advent of digital recording technology. So um, that's kind of where I've Socially been. distanced and safe at the same time. Yep. How about that? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> so COVID hits, um, all performances come to a grinding halt. Did you go through a depression process as things started to progress? Well, um, it was scary at first. So I, I wouldn't say depressing so much as, as, as sleepless nights of being terrified. You know, I, I have a mortgage. I have a child. I, I have, um, you know, I have a lot of, a lot of irons in the fire, a lot of plates spinning, you know. And so when, when COVID first hit and they said, okay, everyone go home, you know, I didn't, no, nobody knew it was going to be a year or more, you know, so I, I didn't, it was almost good in a way that it was just sort of like, okay, this will just be a couple months. You know, frankly, we, we could all use a break. Um, I, I think I'll be okay. I'll go on unemployment. You know, we'll, we'll work it out. Everything will be all right. We have enough savings to get us through. Um, and once, once we realize that everything's getting thrown out the window, all the rules are getting broken, this is uncharted territory. Um, I, I actually have, have been in a, in a place of... Um, I guess curiosity more than anything, curious about what 
Um, curious if I will ever be a performing blue man again. Curious about, um, you know, what do I want to do with my life? And um, so it, I haven't had much time to worry. I've been much more uh, engaged than I expected I would be. Yeah. It's interesting how we've we've all become philosophers. I think to a particular yeah. extent, we've had to we have to reimagine our art form every day. I mean. Uh, for me, as a college professor teaching orchestra and chorus and a traveling conductor, and you know, I've had to rethink what what am I doing? What am I? What's my what's my role in society? And how am I going to keep my students learning? How am I going to keep my communities together? It's really changed a lot of the landscape, and um, I think it will yeah. for for. I mean, this is a once in a lifetime, truly once in a lifetime. I don't think Broadway is ever closed for more than a couple of days. Maybe a snowstorm oh. might have canceled a few days, right? No, this but, is this is utterly unprecedented. Yeah, this has never happened before. No, no way. You know, and, and I think, um, you know, we had the obviously the plague back in the earlier part of the, the 20th century, but Broadway wasn't like it was now. Yeah, this is uh, nobody knows what to do. I mean, the, the Spanish flu didn't cancel a single performance at the Metropolitan Opera. I did the research. and I'm like, how is that possible that you oh, know, man. that much disease and we still didn't. And there are a lot of football games that still happened. I mean, it's it's um, this is truly uh, once in a lifetime. And. I think it's going to change so much as we come out of this. So what changes do you see that might happen out of COVID? And, well, I, you and know, the, obviously, obviously there will be some, I mean, I think everyone's talking about, oh my God, there's going to be this explosion of, 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 of attendance at live events. I'm a little bit more um, cautious to say that. I, I think it obviously will happen at some point, but I think in the, in the earlier part of um, say 21 into 22, I think we're going to see a slow re-entry into that. Um, Obviously, in, in, if we're going to talk about it on the, uh, you know, Broadway and other sort of large scale, high budget uh, productions, I think it's going to get a little safe. I think they're going to sure bet a lot of things. There's going to be the, the Disney reboots, the, uh, the, 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 the legacy productions are going, to, are going to be what, frankly, the only thing people will be willing to risk um, mounting because, you know, who knows how it's going to go. And then I... With that in mind, I did. I did kind of have this. I, I have this idea, this sort of like blue sky no, idea that um, fringe theater, small fringe theater, experimental theater, new new works will have a renaissance and explosion like we've never seen in 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 smaller venues, hundred seat venues, even smaller than that. Um, you know, s street performing uh, things where it, the 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 stakes are, are kind of low. You know, the overhead is super low. Um, but no doubt about it, there are there are people scribbling all over the planet right now. I imagine people are being just filled with, oh, I can't wait to put this on. I can't wait to, to pitch this idea. But they're not going to be able to. Uh, they're not going to have the same ears, I think, that, that, that were around last year and the years prior immediately. So they're just going to have to put it on themselves. So I think we're going to see this sort of like uh, new, young fringe theater thing happen. I don't know, maybe. That's my, I, I hope. That makes sense. I mean, large, huge, you know, stuffing people into a, a small space, I think that's going to, people aren't going to, you know, I, I think too that people are going to be a little hesitant to get back in big, big groups quickly. Oh, yeah. And even with the vaccine, people are going to be hesitant. And I think um, it makes sense that fringe theater and that small elements, I think the same in music, we're going to see uh, a lot of contemporary, small chamber music, uh, that type of reboot as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, as someone who made their career doing a lot of big oratorios and uh, large orchestra things, I think that's going to be a, the last to come back is these big, huge events. Well, you know, um, who knows? I mean, maybe there'll be a way to, to, to take this hybrid model. And, and it's, I know it's such an ugly word, annoying word probably now, but to take, take it and see, see what we can do with it in a way that, that makes sense, you know, have it, have it work with well, a smaller audience, but a larger audience virtually potentially. We got a question. Another question. This is from this is from Sharice from Toronto, and she a first guest from Toronto. And she asks, uh, "What does the captain mean when it says blue uh, man captain?" Oh, I just have epaulets that I have to wear on stage and a couple stars <laughs> on my chest. You know, people have to salute on stage. I'm so sorry. That was pointless. Um, I <laughs> the captain. And he does comedy too. <laughs> hey, I'm here all week. No, I'm actually here for probably another half hour. Um, I. Uh, <laughs> The captain, really, that is something that was a hangover from Dance Captain on Broadway. Um, there's a, it's a role, and the Dance Captain is just sort of a, 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 a liaison between certain creative elements, uh, creative directing elements, and, and the cast. So same thing, 
Blue Man Captain is really what I, I was there to sort of consolidate the chatter between the cast and all of the other technical and creative elements uh, involved at the, at the theater and beyond. So in other words, simple things like, did the Blue Man like this particular makeup remover or that one? You don't have to get seven emails from the seven Blue Men in the cast, you just get one from me. Um, you know, I would go to meetings, uh, a bi-weekly um, artistic um, multi-departmental uh, meetings to talk about things that were working on stage, weren't working. I mean, Blue Man has an intense, uh, and I mean this in a good way, but an intense uh, uh, communicative process where everyone is talking all the time. After every single show, every night, without exception, we have a notes session. So the stage manager, the, some of the musicians, the lighting, sound, they come into the Blue Man dressing room and we discuss the show, every single show. And uh, we are frank with each other about things that were working or not working. The, the Blue Man talk to each other about choices that we made on stage. So um, some out of those conversations sometimes are things that need action. And so that's what I was there to, to, to help to see those things through. And the other side of it was, is I was kind of a, um, I guess like a vibe leader, you know, I have a, a say in sort of setting the tone for how the blue men were going to interact with the, uh, with the, with the space. And that was mostly useful for our younger or rather newer performers that maybe didn't realize that when there's no bag in the garbage can, go get a garbage bag. You don't ask the makeup or, makeup or wardrobe person to do that. Things like that. You know, we were um, sort of like having to show people how it worked there. How big is the New York cast for the show? So there were seven full-time blue men, um, and then what we call the bench. So uh, particular to New York were a lot of blue men that, that had a, some career, a few years, five years, and then eventually decided for various reasons that they didn't want to do it full-time anymore, but said, but I'm open to perform. So we would have, um, oh, the bench was, was quite long. We had about 10 maybe other blue men living in New York that could come in and, and fill in. Um, and especially during the holidays, during the holiday season from um, just before Christmas to New Year's, we would do sometimes 25 shows in a single week. Um, wow. Yeah. So obviously I can't I'm, I, I, I max out at eight or eight or maybe nine and I'm fried. So um, we would have quite a bit of uh, additional support for that. Does the show change over time that you've been involved for like how many years, over 15 years? Yeah. To a little over 15 years, yeah. Um, I, in, in that time, I, I'd seen, I, I started just when a new iteration had gone in. Um, the show, they, they would rename it. Even it was always kind of Blue Man Group, but they have these names that were necess weren't necessarily marketed. But I came in when the rewired version. Originally, when it mounted in 91, it was called Tubes, the name of the show, Blue Man Group Tubes. And then in, um, and then in 2004, it became rewired. Um, and Rewired was, you know, they, they modernized some things. Um, and then in 2010, it became 5G. And I was uh, out on the road when 5G happened. And then since 5G, um, there's just been what we would call tweaks along the way, but not a major, at least at Astor, not a major mounting of a, of a, of a total overhaul. Um, that actually had just happened in Chicago. They had totally redone the show. That was something we were we were going to potentially pull some elements from to, to do in New York. And how do the how does uh, how do they add um, segments to the, such a such a long running show? How does how do they find new thing new um, uh, chapters that work? Well, that is, you know, of, of the two big challenges, you know, doing the show night after night with with a degree of, of, of um, authenticity, and finding new ways for the blue man to express himself. Those are probably the two biggest challenges in, in, that we faced, because. You know, he's a, he's a silent character that expresses himself in a very specific way, but it's, it can be, if you look at it through a certain lens, it can be quite limited. Um, it's not, but um, through that lens, some people would say, well, he can only do this, this, and this. So he had a lot of people that would write for us. Um, I'd do some writing. It would be these, um, these one, two, three jokes, we would call them, where we're like, fail, fail, or what, if thing went right, thing went right, this guy did it wrong. Um, that joke works. It, it kind of always works, but um, we were pushing ourselves to, to, to not rely so much on, on, on the sort of staid uh, existing platforms of, of humor and expression. And we were getting more into 
maybe let's just do weird stuff. Let's just make him weird. Let's darken the character. He has a clearly a dark side. Um, you hold that intense stare, and sometimes you don't know if he's gonna fight you or hug you. You know, and that moment of of, indis- of not knowing what the blue man is thinking, we felt was our greatest charm. Um, the thing that we had to harness the, the most. So how do you exploit that? Um, it was difficult because we also were skewing younger. We were having a lot more families and children coming to the show, so we don't want to frighten them. Um, so that was a, quite a difficult challenge to find moments where we felt that the Blue Moon was gaining gravity, was, was more grounded in, on that stage, but wasn't, you know, terrifying, <laughs> frankly. Um, because that starkness of the character, the, the blue eye, the big blue eyes, the silent, the intensity, you know, you don't want to furrow your brow, but it was sort of like something like this. Um, I've gone up to 10 year old kids and, and ha- they fold. I've seen, I've seen adults kind of, uh, so I've made kids cry left and right. And I'll tell you at a certain <laughs> age, I'm like, yeah, I felt good. <laughs> I felt like I was <laughs> su- sufficiently intense, but um, yeah, it was always a challenge. It was a challenge. And also there was a, a notion of, of how much do we want to comment on current events? And it's always dicey because, you know, once you put an iPhone in the show, which we did, we had iPhones that would come down from the ceiling. We had the iPhone 4, the, 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 the framework, the, the design of what was the iPhone 4. Well, now we're on the iPhone Infinity and it doesn't look <laughs> anything like it. I know, it doesn't look like it anymore. So it, that was a danger too, where you're, you're going to look dated if, if you make it too, too kind. It's interesting how you have to adapt to um, the times and keep changing a formula that works and and um, keep that brand as you know that high level. And what are some things you've written for the for the project? Um, mostly, not I, can't, I don't know if anything actually made it into the sort of running the, the, the long running show. That is such a glacial process that um, it's very difficult. We, I, we we barely had any new material at, at, to that extent come in. But I did. Um, I did write some stuff for um, things that were filmed. In fact, my, one of my things I'm, I'm proudest of outside of actually um, performing as a Blue Man was I directed uh, a piece that was um, a, a, a 25, uh, New York in 25, which was something that when people got off the plane at, at JFK or LaGuardia, in the back of the cab, that little TV screen, there would be um, Blue Men would do what they love about New York. What's what, what the blue man loves about New York. And it was a whole series of, of celebrities that were doing this. Um, and they would sit and say, oh, I love to go to, 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 to Joe's Pizza. And I love to get this and I love to do that. But obviously, I, a blue man can't walk in and say, you know, what my favorite thing to do is when you get the BLT, you know, we can't do any of that. You know, so we had to find a way to to express it through sort of notions like ideas about things that, 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 that are great about New York that, that anybody would love. It was a difficult challenge, but we did it. And we did it through visual representations like um, bike delivery of food and, and, um, and you know, hot coffee anytime. And uh, it was a very big success in the ad campaign. And they ended up running it in um, Bryant Park. They have a film series and they would run the one I directed for the films. And, and um, that was, I sort of wrote the treatment for it. And that was, that was something I was very proud of. Have you have, have your eyes on more directing coming up in the future? Um, well, I, I, honestly, my, my biggest route to that would be if, if Blue Man were to start up again, and who knows what my uh, how my job would, would would exist. I don't know what how I would be rehired. I, I don't know if I would be captain or anything like that. So, um, yeah, if that were to come around, I would think that would be my likeliest uh, outlet for directing. But um, who knows? Maybe, maybe there's something. Um, creatively outside of Blue Man uh, as a director. I, you know, it's funny you should ask because I've never thought of that. Hey, if I, if I get a gig, I'll, I'll give you 10%. <laughs> I'll pitch it to, uh, to some people I know. <laughs> yeah, all right. That's the Hollywood way, right? Yeah. So um, what are some other things you've got your eyes on now? Now that you've, uh, you've had some time away from the, uh, the, the steady job, what are some things that you, um, what are some goals you may have and what are something you may have learned during this period? Um, well, goals are I, I um, you know, I, 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 I was my identity was so tied to being a blue man. Um, it was inevitable that that would happen. It wasn't that I, I, I had this fragile eggshell ego. Otherwise, it was just that you know, you can't when you go to a party. I had this little pearl, this little beautiful little gem I would hold in my lapel in my in my breast pocket, 
And if I wanted to bring it out, I could. But if I didn't want to discuss it, I didn't have to do that either. And so to have that there was always such a kick, you know? Um, and I've had to, to some extent, let that go. And that's been a unique and, um, and frightening, a little bit frightening experience to say, okay, I, I'm not a blue man anymore. I can't say that. I was a blue man. And so that's something I've had to kind of get good with. And um, with that is the next question. Well, what are you, you know? And, um, you know, I, I, like I said earlier, I'm very passionate about the drums, but, but um, I'm also passionate about audio and, and technology. And I've been looking at, I, I, sort of, I, I started a company um, called Nearfield, excuse me, that um, focuses, well, it's really just, I don't know what it's going to be at this point. I, I think it's going to be What's the name of that company again? So people can find it's, out? It's Nearfield. And it's one word, N-E-A-R-F-I-E-L-D, Nearfield. Um, and so uh, it was really at, at, at the outset when I formed Nearfield, it was about how am I going to enhance the virtual learning experience or virtual performance experience um, through, through, you know, using better audio, better video. And, um, and, and through that process, I've actually got, kind of got, got more interested in just audio in general and, um, and, and the amazing developments of technology that have happened since I was, in, I was actively in the industry. And so I see myself moving in that direction, technically. I, I did work as a, on the tech side of audio on the manufacturing side also as well before, but I worked for a company called Sennheiser, Sennheiser Microphones. Um, so maybe there's that, um, but yeah, I, I don't know. I, I just, uh, I'm open, I'm staying open and, and, and who knows, I, I do expect, you know, I'm touching wood, I don't know, but I do expect that I'll, that I'll wear the, the makeup again in some form. I, I know that, because when I talk to people and I talk, so when I'm in situations like this and I, and I talk about the show, I realize that, oh yeah, there's still a lot of interest. There's still a lot of people that see this. No, 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 this thing isn't going away. This is something, this is part of the world. You know, how could you expect it would go away? Um, so I'll, maybe I'll, you know, be a blue man and other things. Maybe I'll have more of a, of a patchwork kind of thing, you know? Yeah, I think that uh, people are going to want that. You know, as theater starts to open up again, people are going to want that that, uh, that that brand. They're going to want that exciting performance experience and you'll be back on the stage putting the makeup back on and um but with other skills as well yeah you know i i i had this sort of idea before covid was you know on the on the radar here i am i'm, I'm in my mid 40s and I'm, I'm for 50s on the horizon i thought 50 i'm gonna do it till i'm 50 and uh i'll probably be pretty close to 50 when when i'm just getting going again so um i i i don't know i i, I just imagine you know what 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 does anybody, you know, what do you, what do you know what's, what's, what's around the corner? I, I just, I'm just staying open and, and yeah. I think it's it. taught us one of the things that this whole this whole period is teaching all of us in the arts is that um, whatever we thought was going to be is going is going to be something totally different to be in the moment to take what we have and to take stock in that our families and all the good things and uh, and be flexible. Yeah, yeah, and then do stuff like this, you know, um, uh, have a chance to kind of connect in a different way. There didn't seem to be as much opportunity or interest for this sort of thing before, but now. Um, through these, you know, moments of connection, talking, people, you know, about what I did and, and about the industry, has has allowed me to sort of restack it in my in my brain and, and kind of prioritize the things that were really important to me. That, and and uh, that's been a, a very interesting experience. It's it's essentially like a version of therapy. It's been very cathartic for to, all um, of us. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's why I started yeah. this. I I was supposed to be conducting in Europe quite a bit this summer, and I said, well, now that everything's grounded, what am I going to do with myself? Yeah. So I said, why don't I start talking to colleagues? I miss everybody. You know, Great this idea. Has been my therapy, I, should, I guess. I should have done it. It's still my idea. It's still my <laughs> idea that I didn't have. So, Mark, what do you what do you have to say to young people coming up in the business right now? Okay, so this is important. Listen up. Uh, no, honestly, if you have the slightest interest or inkling in performing, in whatever aspect of performing, go, do it. We need you. You know, um, I think there's 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 a bit of a, a of a of a shaky feeling on the ground for a lot of people, and and a reaction to that could be to jump to things that seem more stable. 
there'll always be those things. If you have an inkling towards the arts, run towards them. I think what's going to happen is, is um, you know, unfortunately, there will be a bit of a void for me. A lot of people, um, a lot of people that I work with, blue men that I work with, have have moved on already. They've gone on to other careers and probably to the point where they they're not going to be extricated back to being a blue man once the show starts running again. So a lot of people are moving on. There's there's a bit of a moment where where there's going to be some room for new performers. So if you got the inkling, get going now because that you're going to be filling those shoes. And that said, this is something that's so that's sort of related to COVID. But outside of all that, at, at any moment in, in, in our life, I think you just need to, to pursue what you want to pursue. I think the notion of a backup plan is, is, is good, more so as an exercise. But I would say, to get your backup plan, go ahead and try it. I think people say you get one shot, you get one shot, you, know, you only get one go at this life. I strongly disagree with that idea. You get a lot of shots. I didn't start. I've, done, I've had several careers myself. I can. I, can, yeah. I resemble that remark. <laughs> right. I didn't start blooming until I was thirty, and to a lot of young people, thirty seems decrepit and ancient. It's it's old, you know. So I thank God it's not. <laughs> thank God it's not. But it, but it is advanced in 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 the adult life. At thirty, you know, you could be well on your way to becoming a doctor. You could be on this path or that. I completely, totally reinvented myself at thirty. Um, so. Who knows? Maybe I, I would have been on a path to be a doctor and boom, I got the Blue Man audition. You know, I, I think that that just the idea of just saying yes, yes, yes. The, and that's the other big thing is that more than anything else, um, you know, I, I can trace back to the moment I got the Blue Man audition. I can trace back to a single instance of a meeting with a single person. Um, and I think we can all do that. You, you can you can see the path of how did I get to here? Well, I met this person and then I got that gig and then this happened and then blah, blah, blah. So. You never know at what part of that journey you're already on as a young person. You know, at 16, if you're living in a big city, you could be making friends with somebody that's going to be the person that's going to hire you for that. You know, it just so never it's it's, it's very corny and kind of trite, but never overlook, ne ne never assume that, that you have the edge on somebody, never assume that somebody doesn't have a viable place in your in your story say yes be, be commit be engaged follow through be nice be friendly answer calls and that's like 90 percent of it it's just being like a cool person that's it the other 10 so percent is the sweat. people want to work with i'm not the truth that should be a Absolutely. chapter in every book is be nice <laughs> be nice and you know be nice and, and do what you say you're going to do and and uh and show up on time and don't be a pain in the ass Mark, thank you so much, and we wish you the we wish you the best as things start to open up again, and um, continued success for you and for your family as well. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank, and same to you, Jason, and to whomever is listening. Um, yeah, let's 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 make it through the other side, and I'll, I'll see you in the audience, and I'll, I'll give you. A, I won't smear you. I'll just give you a little bat. <laughs> I look forward to it. <laughs> Thank okay. you for joining us on Music Matters with Jason Tram. We really appreciate you joining us today. Please remember to subscribe to us on YouTube and hit that bell icon for the most up-to-date information on upcoming guests and topics. Please like and share our videos on social media, and you can join our mail our email list by going on to www.jasontram.net. You can also see our 82 past episodes and all of our upcoming guests and topics. Our next show will be tomorrow, that's Monday, at 1 o'clock, I believe, with, John, with Michael John Tram. A wonderful rising superstar composer uh, whose music is being performed all around the world. So thank you so much for joining us and remember, keep music alive. Good night.